If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah. 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 Sending out good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Instead of going forward, they want them to just stay in place and have these vain experiences that don't lead to anything. The sort of um, always seeking and never coming to the truth is characteristic of the new age. Welcome back to Grab America Show. We are, well, I won't be because I was still at work, but Graham, living the dream Dunlop, uh, is chatting with Terry Wolf a little bit later. <laughs> About, uh, well, I guess a lot of revelation sort of stuff, like you're saying. Yeah, Christian, Christian, uh, basically like Christian pushback on all the conspiracies that we talk about, kind of from a sort of a satanic Christian angle. Like, it's all the he's devil. got some really interesting theories. I mean, he is like the fourth rider of the apocalypse is green, it's the pale green rider of basically like the green movement, just so destroying like, the earth. But, oh, is this fuck. like, uh, Buddy's mom and the water boy, or? Everything's the devil. Who's balls um, the devil? Yeah, kind of. I mean, maybe. I, I don't know that reference, but I mean. Wait, you never seen The it, Water Boy? No. Come well, on. I, if I did a long time ago, I can't remember it. It's just. You've seen like every movie for the last 40 years and you haven't seen The Water Boy? I haven't. I don't watch movies anymore, dude. I don't anymore. It came out in the 90s. I don't know. Yeah. No. Oh. You tell me I don't get references. I give you a nice, a nice like. Mid nineties fucking softball reference, and you fucking miss it. I mean, I can't believe it. But you guys expect me to get these just crazy obscure, obscure things, yeah. 70s fucking references from before I was alive. Was it Tommy, the guy's name? Who? The water boy was Tommy. No, see, I don't know. See, I don't even know. I don't know. His name was Water Boy. Maybe Bobby. Bobby, maybe Bobby, yeah. Bobby. Like it was, it was, uh, what's his name, right? That Adam comedian Zama. guy, right? Adam oh, Zama. see, I don't know. I thought it was like the the chunkier comedian guy. It's what's his Adam name? Sala, it turns out to be the crazy. van down by the river guy. That guy, he's who's been, that he's guy? Dead, man. He's been dead. I know. I thought that was the guy from Waterboy. Actually, he no? I don't think he's in it. No. No? It's like okay. a whole little Adam Sandler crowd, you know? He's okay. got those, yeah, those yeah, dudes yeah. that follow him yeah. around. Yeah. yeah, it's probably pretty funny. Okay. Be like if one of us made it famous, I guess, and just to drag our buddies along and fucking make movies together. And that seems to be what happens. And then they all get some of them get really high and make movies that just get more and more ridiculous. This is a problem with just smoking too much weed and doing too many drugs. I think. Take a look at the Seth Rogen crew and the movies that those movies sort of just spun out of control. I kind of like the randomly threw on one of the latest ones like a year and a half ago, and I was like, "What the fuck is happening?" <laughs> Like they were always a little bit out there, but it just seems like it's like. <whistles> so yeah, I'm trying to think of a movie watch lately. I can't think of one. The last one I watched was when the moon was crashing. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I forget what happened. Well, I just watched a movie length episode of Stranger Things. If that counts. Sure. That's amazing. Oh, I bet. That it was, it was like honestly, dude, from for TV for like Netflix. Get, I mean, I thought it was pretty incredible. I thought it was pretty do you incredible. Like, what do you just hit your treadmill if, while you watched Netflix? I should, I should put, I should try and put the TV by the treadmill. Yeah, totally. great. That'd be great. Might idea. have to lube up that treadmill and get it working again. I mean, it's summer, you should just get outside. <laughs> Are you supplementing vitamin D? <laughs> We got you out yesterday, but you do look a little pale still. That was a fun trip. You took us out in the four by or almost four by four and in the in the mountains. I mean, holy shit, dude. I that was charge amazing, for this, yeah. eh? On the on the big plateau there, Plateau Mountain. I mean, I wondered if I was thinking, I wonder if they were if the indigenous made it up on top of that plateau and like that's a it seemed like a bit of a sacred place in a way. Like 
Seems like how a flat it was and to. how like, like high up it was. I, You're just on this huge there wasn't plateau. A lot of you can Indians see all the Rockies living and, in the mountain peaks, bro. Just, I know, you know but, like it's really not hospitable. The people. Yeah, and it was pretty rocky up there. I feel like it would be hard for like a a handful of us to survive up around there for an extended period of time, let alone like. A few trying to feed a few hundred people up there, like we would have that little water hole up there just fucking drained in no time. Yeah, and now it's fun, but uh, maybe you could be up there chasing sheep around and stuff. In the, I mean, that's when you'd be up there, I guess, right? When you went hunting. Yeah, and the other spot that you took us to in the dirt road there with the uh, beautiful meadow, like sort of the meadowy hills and the mists. And I mean, geez, I felt like we were right out of Europe. It's, it felt like European. It felt like Swiss kind of Alps. That It felt like that type of environment there. That's or the, the first Scottish time. Highland kind of stuff. Like That's the first time I drove my truck up there. Yeah, that's Usually beautiful. Usually we park at the there. gate and walk. Yeah, yeah. It's a long walk, dude. It takes hours to go do that. Yeah. Took us only 10 minutes in the truck, though. Actually, so it's probably not hours. It's probably like an hour walk. Yeah. No, that was good, there. dude. Yeah, it was fun to get out and see that we saw some grizzlies and some of the, what were those sheep we saw? The, the, big the rams. Sheep. Big, what were they called? Bighorn sheep? Bighorn sheep. Bighorn sheep. Yeah, they were Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. I Rocky believe. Mountain bighorn sheep and some grizzlies. That was pretty cool. Yeah, the yeah. grizzlies were a thing. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go, uh, Cruise out again next weekend. See if we can see some more bears. We got right. Kevin from Unpaved uh, with us yesterday, and he's going to be on the show. We're going to do a recording with him this Tuesday. That'll be fun. Yeah. So, yeah, we yeah. had a time. We'll All tour. our friends from CAC, last CAC will know him. Should uh, I should be charging money for these tours. Yeah, that could have been a CAC event. So then we wouldn't have seen any bears, and it might have snowed. Didn't snow, though. I wonder if it snowed up there. I don't think it was cold enough. No, it was, only went it down was to like almost, six almost degrees. Cold almost cold enough. Yeah, few more degrees and it could have snowed. Yeah. So I got a I got a clip from uh, some X. I got an X Files clip I want to play. Everybody, it'll kind of fit in with this episode with Terry too, because I mean he talks about all the, he kind of deconstructs all these rabbit holes in his book Fire in the Rabbit Hole. He kind of goes through all of them, everything from Q to uh, Flat Earth and ancient mysteries and all, all the kind of stuff we get wrapped up in. And he kind of pokes holes in it all in a, in a good way. It's funny because I'm kind of like the, the new age villain in his, and a villain's not a, a, a proper description because it's that not a, a novel great word but, for you, but a new age villain, you know, and, and yet I hipster. agree with a lot of stuff he talks a about new in age his book. Hipster like, villain. And a what? A new age hipster villain. Hipster. Dude, no. You're a little hipstery. The metrosexual. Uh, That's what we his, called it in the 90s before like and gen, genders became and a thing and all that. You're just like a little bash of it all. What? You were <laughs> bashful? You were a, a mash of it all. Mash of it all. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you were a little gender fluid before it was a thing. No, it wasn't about that. It was more of a sexuality thing, not a gender thing. Yeah. It was just about being comfortable with your feminine side back then. Like, it was, it was cool. <laughs> was it? <laughs> I must have missed that part. <laughs> All right, what do you got for us, Dunlap? Well, I got a quote. Cool, I want to read a quote from his book. Living. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so can I play Because he gets into, yeah, and then I'm going to read something from Revelation. From what? From Revelation. This is from our chat. We need this is from Graham, the chat. So I found this Pastor in the chat today. Father Graham. What? Father Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who reads scripture? A pastor. <laughs> Father Graham. It's Sunday. Who reads scripture? A pastor. It's Sunday, even. I mean, this is ridiculous, bro. You are straight up starting a religion now. A cult? I mean, it's just a sect of Christianity. It's the profound quote of the week. Graham's gonna start a cult. <laughs> Darren, can you guess it? If you if I if you don't hear from me, I'm it's with the Mennonites the in Manitoba. Quote of the week. Why not the Hutterites in Alberta? 
Well, that's where Terry's from. He's from Manitoba. So. Oh, did he offer you a place? I'm going to convert. I could use some outside seeds so they marry you in. I'm just fed up of all this stuff. I'm so, just going to go. Just go. I'm going to get just simple, we, straight down to the Christ. What? And when I first moved here, I knew some local guys. I met some local yeah. guys, and they used to tell me about gunny sacking. Many nights, Mennonites. Some local guys, not Mennonites. local. What? What they guys? Mennonites. Like, They're just what, like, guy, what dudes, local guys? Local guys to Calgary. My first. What's, moved a, what's west. gunny sacking? Oh no! What's that? <laughs> that's what I said. What's gunny sacking? And they're like, well, that's when you go, and you go out to the Hutterite colonies. Now, I am not, this is, I'm just repeating the story. That's it. Oh, no. Not... We're going to get canceled over this or something. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, un... because, I mean, some of these colonies, I guess, they need to get, you know, something new in there once in a while. Some new, uh, blood, blood? Some new bloodlines. What? Right. So, but. They go, and you have to, the rumor is you would have to fit a certain protocol that I might not fit, but you might. And uh, actually, Because you're Indian? I didn't, I'm just saying. Or is it about your belief system? Is it because I'm a new age villain? Because you're white. Because I'm white? Okay. But that could be bullshit. I've never gone gunny sacking. I've only heard from the outside, but I've heard it from a bunch of people. So I'm positive it's a real thing. Anyway, so you go and you have sex with these people. And, I was thinking uh, you might say that. Yeah, but uh, in a gunny sack, they're like in you, a gunny sack. They're so in it's the just gunny like sack. Some legs sticking out and a sack up top, so that you know they don't ever see it. And it's not very. And sexual. you don't get to see them. No, you just go in there and fuck just drop rip. your seed, and that's yeah, and that's it. Really? Town. Yeah, that's what I. This is. Do you get paid for it or something, or do you, I, you get paid? Yes. I wonder how paid. much you get paid nowadays with if you have unjabbed sperm. I mean, oh, this might man. be. A, this <laughs> might be a thing. Like, how do you spell gunny sack? G u n n y sack. Oh well. Gunny Sackin yeah. says something very different. Yeah, it's not, gonna be, it's not going to be. It's not going to be a well-known thing. It's just this is like. This is the first time you're getting the local legend from Alberta. So how come they couldn't just populate their own peoples? I don't get it. Inbreeding. That's what I heard. Wow. You don't get to choose or anything? Like, you just got to, like, just go in. I don't think so, no. No. I thought maybe you are going to get trapped in a gunny sack with somebody and something, like... So maybe this is, maybe I'm full of shit. I don't know. I'd be curious to see what they, if the listeners have ever heard of this phenomena. Because uh, the internet says, I, I'll tell you what, Wikipedia says, gunny sacking is a metaphor used in conflict resolution, which involves the act of storing up grievances acquired in the course of a relationship. I've been gunny sacked a few times then. Turns out, I have. <laughs> we all have. <laughs> anyway, so, so the, okay. that's the legend. Let's get back okay, to your so, quote. So, if you don't know where I am, I might be with the Mennonites of Manitoba. Or anyways, this sacking. this is <laughs> this is just a quote from uh, his book talking about the methods of the conspirators. Their methods are gradual, spread out, and adaptive, always carried out under noble-sounding pretexts or supposed emergencies, and always with the full support of what I call the narrative investment complex to safeguard their progress. Populism has pushed them to new levels of desperation. So it's really interesting, his take on sort of like Trump and populism and how that's kind of, in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of exaggerated or accelerated their whole sort of take over here the green movements the fourth uh, rider of the apocalypse the pale green rider and the green movement which is going to destroy us you know it's, it's all it's accelerated it's been accelerated but like you said a long time ago like if trump wasn't there like they they the, a lot of these locked like this stuff wouldn't have been able to happen right people wouldn't have just held back if it was sort of hillary in, in office you know 
Anyways, let's not get down uh, too far into there, but I am going to read something from uh, this is from our chats, too, which I was just browsing today to try and get some content for the intro. And there's so many awesome people in the chats. I can't even keep up with all the little channels and stuff in there. But this revelation thing was put in there, which fits so well, because he talks a lot about revelation. Um, So there's a bunch of different versions of it. Let me pick out the one that. Oh, my God. What happened to it? Oh, it's gone. Oh, my God. What happened? Oh, there it is. Pro. Um, The light of the lamp will never shine in you again. So this is Revelation 1823. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived your nations with your sorceries. So they people have deconstructed this because sorcery... I'll read this whole thing here. So what does Revelation 18.23 mean? Earlier versions depict the doom of Babylon as a giant millstone being thrown into the uh, ocean. It's run. It's ruin in the end times will be total, sudden, inescapable. These verses continue to emphasize the total destruction of the city by noting all the activities which will seize. By the time of the tribulation, the city and possibly the associated government of Babylon is seen worldwide as a bright shining city. After its fall, the lights will go out. The lights will never again come on in Babylon. Also, there will be another wedding in Babylon. Although the city's merchants were known throughout the world for their successful enterprises, they will never again produce any goods or strike a deal. They will never swindle buyers again. Their cash registers will go silent and stay silent when God rains judgment upon their wicked city. So this verse that we're talking about here, 1823, implies that Babylon was a city of sorcery. The Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia, from which we derive the word pharmacy. Most likely the sorcery of end times Babylon will include drug production and trafficking. Substances such as illicit drugs control and enslave people, making them easier to manipulate. The the, The beast city of Babylon will likely be a bastion of drug addicts and dealers. All versions of sorcery will be ended when God destroys Babylon. So, the, I mean, obviously, in the chats, the, the context was about other types of pharmacia. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, like, Terry's Terry's kind of, part of, part of his thing is, like, they've kind of just resigned to, like, and not resigned in a surrendered way, but, like, the, this is part of the, like, the fall is going to happen, right? And then we'll see if 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 we can come out of this or not but they're kind of just like well this is what satan does he destroys this he destroys the world satan does yeah can god, i uh, play the extra jingle god destroying the shit and all the smiting us that was actually satan the whole time well i mean this is the big controversy right is it that's the yeah. first i've heard of it can i play uh How big the expo jingle how can this be the first I've heard of this big controversy? Why are you trying to... Dude, we've talked about it all the time on the show. Whether it's Satan or not. Yeah. Or God. Or either. Or neither. Maybe it's both. We talk about this in the show, right? All the overt symbolism. All. Why is it all there, right? Why do they have to get into all that? I don't know. Well, you got to listen to the show to find out. Our show? Yeah. This episode or all of them? Yeah, this episode. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's the X Files. Pat Kelly has been making claims. Claims about what? You and everyone you know has a piece of DNA in your genome put there without your knowing it. Put by whom? Well, that's the question of the day. This is an internet lunatic. You're not saying you believe him. Hold on, Agent Einstein. You're talking to a scientist. Uh, Forgive me, Assistant Director. It may sound insensitive, but the suggestion is pure science fiction. What I'm saying, Agent Einstein, is that the facts, as I understand them, cannot be discounted out of hand. No one has the right or the ability to tamper with your DNA. Unless we gave them that ability. When you say they're tampering with our DNA, that they're able to shut down our immune systems by the addition of something to our DNA. Yes, but I don't know how exactly. How it's being triggered. I don't know that either. Or why it's happening now. What can we possibly do? We need to act quickly. 
You were right about that. Well, I was wrong about the science. I was wrong about what's causing it. Dead wrong, in fact. It, but it's clearly a widespread failure of our. Are you playing the whole episode? Or? No, no, it's, virus it's, it's, within it's a virus highlight. that was put okay. there through the smallpox vaccine. It's what these men are calling the Spartan virus. Smallpox, Spartan this out. immune system. What's wrong with the science? Okay. Spartan virus removes the adenosine deaminase gene from your DNA. It removes the ADA gene and your immune system will simply vanish. Yeah, but I'm not getting sick. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> okay? So how does it work? How does the virus remove the ADA gene? A process called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, RNA and a protein cutting genes at exact locations. Exactly. But in this instance, used as a weapon. The ultimate weapon the ability to depopulate the planet to kill everyone but the chosen by tampering with their DNA through gene editing why do such a thing and lie about it our own government your own government lies as a matter of course as a matter of policy the Tuskegee experiments on black men in the 30s Henrietta Lacks what are they trying to do that's the missing piece but it's not hard to imagine a government hiding hoarding technology for 70 years at the expense of human life and the future of the planet. Driven not only by corporate greed, but a darker objective. The takeover of America. And then the world itself, by any means necessary, however violent, or cruel, or efficient. By severe drought, brought on by weather wars, conducted secretly using aerial contaminants and high altitude electromagnetic waves. In a state of perpetual war, to create problem, reaction, solution scenarios to distract, enrage, and enslave American citizens at home were tools like the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act, which abridge the Constitution in the name of national security. The militarization of police forces in cities across the U.S., the building of prison camps by the Federal Emergency Management Agency with no stated purpose, the corporate takeover of food and agriculture, pharmaceuticals and healthcare, even the military in clandestine agendas to fatten, dull, sicken, and control a populace already consumed by consumerism. And I encourage you all to go shopping more. A government that taps your phone, collects your data, and monitors your whereabouts with impunity. A government preparing to use that data against you when it strikes. And the final takeover begins. The takeover of America. By a well-oiled and well-armed multinational group of elites that will cull, kill, and subjugate. Happening as we sit here. It's happening all around us. The other shoe waiting to drop. It'll probably start on a Friday. The banks will announce a security action necessitating their computers to go offline all weekend. Digital money will disappear. They can just steal your money? Followed by the detonation of strategic electromagnetic pulse bombs to knock out major grids. What will seem like an attack on America by terrorists or Russia. An invasion of the U.S. The Russians tried it in 47. That's that pretty good, eh? One, oh, uh, yeah. Weather warfare. Is DNA, that all from one episode? EMPs. No, no, no. That's from. Uh, that's. Uh, I think that's a bunch of clips. Uh, a bunch of apps cl- clipped together. I think. The first half was one episode. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of it from that one, and maybe even from that the recent. Like I think it's from the more recent one, right? So there's. So you didn't make that yourself. No, fuck no, 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 of course not. Why well, you make that sound like it's just outrageous that <laughs> you would? <laughs> I will put a link to it in the show notes though before I forget. All right. But that's pretty. I mean, that's pretty bang on a lot of things. Do you think the X Files is predictive programming? Um, maybe I am. Well, I'm you not should saying, know what's coming. Well, this then. is the thing that Terry and us talk about too. Is it intentional or does it just happen because it's in our collective consciousness? Like we're sort of, you know, portending the future. You should have a good idea what's going down. I have no clue. You seen all the X Files? Yeah. What good is all that? If you can't tell Can me, you, what's were next. you a huge fan too, though, back in the day? Mm, I seen a bunch of them, and definitely not all of them. Yeah, I, I definitely wasn't movie. like putting my Friday night on hold to watch. Oh, X-Files. I was. Yeah, yeah like sure, that's yeah. no, that's never been a thing for me. <laughs> I've never like blocked. I think it like, was Thursdays though. So, 
Ah, uh, uh, so I, I would have had a time back then. I would have had a hard time putting my Fridays aside for anything, except for X Files, except for you know partying and X Files. I'm sure it was Friday. Oh, maybe it was Sunday actually. Sunday fun day. Anyways, whatever. That's Anyways, just all stupid. Support irrelevant. the show, grabamerica.ca slash support. If you guys find some little value in our little podcast here, episode 554 coming at you, all available for free back there. If you want to go check them all out, all pretty similar quality, I think, from an audio standpoint. I mean, it's been ever increasing, but it was never bad. Um, Or at least people didn't say it was bad. It always got better. There was some, maybe some, nah, it's all pretty good. Go back there. Check it out. Start at, start at one. Maybe check that out. Check them all out. Dude, E-frame the quality is way better than all these YouTube videos and people doing all the videos now because nobody's really leveling anything out anymore with the videos, right? That's what's so good about podcasting is you've got all the voices and all the sounds. Everything's leveled out nicely, right? When you hear these interviews on YouTube, it just doesn't... It's not the, the same. Ho- the host is coming through twice as loud as the guest and you can't, you know, you can't even... So go um go through them all, grandamerica.ca slash support. If you are getting some value from those 554 shows, head over to grandamerica.ca slash support. Sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation or send some value back our way. And we'll keep putting out these shows for free if you guys are getting some value from them. And uh, it's a nice little switcheroo we do where you send us some value. We keep creating some value and everybody wins. Uh, while you're at it, at it check out GrimmerCoutlaw.ca if you want to check out our other podcast. Or AdultBrain.ca if you want to check out our audio books. Of course, we do have a bonus app coming out probably around the same time it's probably available right now about secret weapons for silent wars silent weapons quiet, for quiet? Secret, silent uh, weapons for quiet wars yeah that's what it is by, we're by unknown yeah author unknown. unknown read by graham dunlop so we put that out across all our feeds so enjoy that and head over to adultbrains.ca and click on that link at the top our books on audible take you to all those books on audible if you want to check out some of those adult brain titles and contact at the cabin.com the Scabland trips in the fall are selling out fast. If that's something you want to get in on, head over to contact at thecabin.com, make a deposit. And uh, if you don't want to do the rattle tour, but you want to come to Mount Shasta and do a bunch of crazy cool shit in the in February, in February with Owen Hunt and Brandon Powell and uh, Joe Roop and maybe some other people are working on maybe adding some people to that event yet. But anyway, if that's something you want to get into, Head over to contact at the cabin.com. All the events are there. Check it out. And if you want to check out our Instagram account there, it's easy to find the Graham Erica show on Instagram. And I put out this little video of uh, what it's like when we're traveling in a convoy of vans with Randall Carlson, um, sort of exploring the terrain and the landscape from the, from the great flood. And we're on Randall radio. So Randall's got, we got, we got it. We're all on a, all the cars are on a radio station and Randall's talking to the whole group of people as we drive through the landscape and, and we've got these two-way radios for the drivers of all the all the cars in the convoy and the vans to to talk back and forth. So it kind of, it's kind of a cool little two-minute video of just like what it's like uh, driving in the convoy. When you get, if you get to ten thousand followers, I think you're allowed to put links in. Oh wow, that's cool. We're yeah. almost there. Yeah, so follow us on Instagram. We're probably at about six thousand or something. I mean, yeah, yeah. So go give Grandma a follow on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, what else did you say? You had an oppo, or did you do that already? Or no, I did that already. Yeah, it's all good. Um, yeah, I did the quote from Terry's website and Revelation, the X Files thing. So I just wanted to read Terry's uh, little bio here. Um, he's a fellow Canadian from Manitoba, grew up in the prairies. Um, the author of Fire in the Rabbit Hole and Maybe Everyone Is Wrong: Revelations, Conspiracy, and the Kingdom of Heaven. He's an independent researcher from Canada's prairies, raised as a Mennonite to fear God and study the word. His viral TikTok videos have been featured on dozens of major platforms and received millions of likes because they explain complex and intimidating topics in an enjoyable and simple way. But he's been banned off of TikTok, I think, since this bio was written. Um, And I think he's back on, but I, I think he's back on... You know, on another account, like we have to do when we get banned off of things, so. Thanks, buddy. That's it. That's it? Well, it sucks when you get banned off stuff. 
Um, yeah, also, I see his, people advocating a, for more banning all the time. He does have a well, so, website too, Wolfpox, W-O-L-F-P-O-X dot com. He's got his other books Wolf and stuff Pox. on there and some PDFs about uh, agency inevitability, Jesuit protocols, covenants and conditions, personality types and the Trinity, stuff like that. So, Is that worse than monkey pox? What were you saying about, uh, <laughs> what were you saying about uh, b- people wanting to be banned? The people want oh, to ban people, people now? People got a real ban thing. Oh, ban this, ban that. I don't know what fucks with Recently, people. like? Yeah, maybe it's always yeah, the, been there. Oh, yeah, it's it. just becoming normal now. People just don't care. They just want to ban people now. Just yeah. ban, cancel. And if you're silent, you're violent. I mean, you got to speak up about things. You got to take a side. Otherwise, you're violent. I just like to enrage all sides. <laughs> it's fun. It's really best. It's better than trying to navigate. I let you all know. I let uh, too many people know how I really feel. Because uh, that would probably get you shot these days. I'd rather not get shot at, because then I'd have to shoot back, and then it's going to get weird. Especially in Canada. Why? Because you can't, there's no self-defense in Canada. You don't want to be You just have to put a knife in their hand after. (laughs) They they tried to stab you. It still doesn't matter, dude. I mean, you can't. He came at me with a knife. He came at me with a knife. That doesn't matter. I even cut myself a bit. That doesn't matter. He stabbed me. So Doesn't shot matter. <laughs> You're times. in Canada, man. There is no self defense. <laughs> well, Let then go. we'll just bury Let him. him. We'll just Let take him, him out to the call the cops. Cannon ask us and bury him, or her. Oh my God! Whoever yeah, this is chose to home invade. <laughs> what? This is this is too much for you. This is too much for you. It's like yeah. when I called the NATO, the North American Terrorist Organization. And you get all giddy, weird. Did, kind I, of did not I get funny? You used that? to. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> like a scared chicken. Um. All right, guys. Well, I guess that's about it. Hope you enjoy the chat with Terry Wolf. I wasn't there, so to be missing that Grimes flair. But Graham handles himself like a pro. He's a real interview aficionado. Just missing a couple of wise facts, so it'd be all right. Support the show. Enjoy the chat with Terry Wolf. Welcome to Grime America. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> the invitation was not expected, but uh, I, yeah, I find this to be a pretty interesting podcast. When I look at the list of topics, a list of things that you're, you guys are exploring every day, or I don't know if every day, but you got hundreds of episodes, so you got to be doing it pretty often. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are. Yeah, we're doing it. Uh, you know, at least uh, like two times a week for for years now, and we've been going for nine years. So, I mean, it's really interesting because I mean, I'm, I'm look. I'm glad you. First of all, I appreciate your your work and you coming on the show. And I mean, it might be a little bit like I don't know. I don't even think frictiony is going to be the word because I mean, but after reading your book, Fire in the Rabbit Hole, I mean, I realized like I'm almost the epitome of your, your villain. And, and yet, <laughs> and yet like, I believe I, I agree with mo- most, or at least a lot of what you're saying in your book. So, Interesting. you know, yeah, it's, so I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to be open, trying to stretch my brain a little bit to think about this. And we're in such an interesting time. Uh, and this, this sort of question between uh, religion and new age and magic and, and all this occult stuff and, and conspiracies at all, it's always popping up. So I figured like you're a pretty good guy to get on the show to sort of give us the other perspective of that, you know? Yeah, I, I think I probably am. Um, I've only started to pay attention to new age stuff in the last, 
uh, a couple of years. Um, I always thought that it was sort of a an old concept that was dying out. I didn't realize how much it was reviving now and becoming taking over, especially taking over the counterculture. And um, and to me, that's where Christianity thrives is in the counterculture, real Christianity as opposed to institutional Christianity. And as a Christian myself, I'm I'm always looking at the counterculture and saying, you know, what can we do here? Because this is where people are actually open minded. And it looks and I guess that's a natural meeting place for New Agers as well, because because that's exactly what you guys are doing, too, is trying to break out of the establishment, you know, paradigm and question things. So and, and I think what's a little different about our show, to be honest, and not to sound um, egotistical or anything about it, but we've explored a lot of the rabbit holes that you've got in your book. But I mean, I, I'm pretty we're pr- I try not to kind of go stay in them for very long, you know, go in and explore a little bit and try not to attach myself to too much of those, the, that sort of those deeper um, mythologies or, or opinions, you know, or ideologies in there. I mean, it's, it's kind of trying to stay open to almost anything, you know? Right. Yeah. So for those who don't know that the, the book fire in the rabbit hole is a follow up to my, uh, my previous book, maybe everyone is wrong. Um, that one is all a huge study of revelation. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, a little bit of a provocative title. Um, and it basically just goes through and debunks a lot of old uh, interpretations of revelation and pointing out problems with them and taking the text more seriously. And then um, sort of seeing these very new conclusions that because of the internet, because of the fact that we have access to so much information, uh, you can now go back and look at things with a much more interesting perspective than, than somebody reading the Bible a hundred years ago. You didn't know anything about, you know, ancient history or things like that, unless you had this giant encyclopedia collection or something like that. So, um, and, you know, in Israel didn't exist, you know, back then. And then there's just all sorts of things that there's, it was time for an updated look at that. And so maybe everyone is wrong was my big study of revelation. And then basically the key danger that I saw uh, for our current day in there was uh, sort of what I call the green world order, the green movement. And then um, I didn't want to, you know, inject all of that into that book. So I wrote a separate one called fire in the rabbit hole, which sort of collects all these different rabbit holes, these, especially occultism and and sort of these um, alternative points of view that are taking over right now. They're very popular. It's actually kind of becoming cool to say that you're, you know, you're looking into rabbit holes these days. People want to show each other and prove to each other that they're not just, you know, watching CNN and relying on mainstream education and stuff. They They want to be part of this thing that's happening where everyone's you know, you don't have to just listen to Alex Jones anymore. There's a lot of different counterculture sort of question the the narrative going on. And, uh, and as part of that, I think there's a lot of bad actors, a lot of people trying to come in and taint that or hijack it or just capitalize on it. And so um, the book is obviously aimed mostly at Christians and it's aimed at uh, Christians who are feeling compelled to look into these things because maybe their friends are or some other conspiracy theorist or somebody they're listening to is is looking into it and they're saying the earth is flat and they're saying that you know whatever they're saying the um storm aliens, is coming the storm is coming yeah there's all these different <laughs> things and um just to warn them to minimize the things that they're getting attached to because uh you know, there's there's fire in that rabbit hole. There's da- there's a danger there that if you get sucked into it, um, you might end up being made a fool of. How much of that is is like you mentioned, sort of bad actors and stuff, right? How much of that is like is designed from intent uh, versus just sort of human nature and what happens with all this information? Like you mentioned, the flood, the flood of information, like the ark, sort of, and and the the analogy to the flood. We're now in a flood of information. I think that it's largely um, so the, the, there's kind of if you want to be very realistic about it, I think what happens is that these none of these ideas are particularly new and that 
they were just being kept suppressed by, you know, the the predominant narratives, and that what has happened in the last ten years, especially 10, 10, 15 years, yeah, is that um, it has flipped on its head where. Um, a lot of good thinking is being suppressed and uh, the wacko ideas are being promoted by algorithms and that I think that the military has an interest in, um, they have cyber warfare divisions. This is, and this is a fact. They have units and people who are designed, they're, they're social engineers. They are trying to create a certain type of culture they're trying to suppress, obviously, foreign propaganda. They are set up to fight foreign propaganda, ISIS, these types of things. These, you know, we there needs to be, I guess, uh, some sort of, you know, protective mechanism, right? And so, but at the same time, they can use that to implant certain ideas, promote certain ideas, and if what they want is not to protect the status quo, if what they want is ultimately to collapse the status quo and create a revolution, um, then I think the psychological warfare machine that they have can easily be used for what we're seeing now, which is this sort of anything goes um, uh, sort of unchecked misinformation. Um, and then you have this very, you know, fake, um, you know, fact checkers all over the place doing their political hack, political fact checking all over the place too. So it's this fake paradigm between this radical um, out there ideas that have no fact checking. And then you have the very fake fact checkers for the establishment and corporations and uh, real truth seeking gets really hurt in the process both ways. So what let's, let's bring in like what day, when did you write your first, uh, the first, the, the two books just to, to in context with uh, like what's happening in the world right now. Um, I wrote, maybe everyone is wrong in 2020. Um, oh, so just, was, yeah. Wow. After, after COVID started then. Well, not really, because I guess that's when it was published. Right. So yeah, I was yeah, writing yeah, it yeah. for like two years before that. And probably about four years before that is when I was doing a lot of research into it. And then I started writing it and then it, it finished and got published in 2020. So actually it was, it was like timed out very interestingly with sort of the middle of 2020 is when it actually got published. But um, yeah, it wasn't a reaction to that. It was a, that sort of fell into the narrative. Did you have to decide to, to whether to put COVID in there at all? Like, cause I, I we've had many authors on where, they had to make a decision like halfway through 2020. Do we include this, this long um, slow motion car crash of a conspiracy or do we leave it out? You know, um, I don't, I know that it wasn't a major thought um, at that time. I actually wrote a different book before that. That was not as it wasn't a commentary, social commentary as much. Um, but that's, that was right at the start of um 2020. And that one, I had a little, I added a foreword at the beginning, an, an author's foreword. And I just mentioned the pandemic and I didn't know what it was going to become because it was still like February or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know how much to say about this. This could be something that goes away in, in a couple months or not. But um, no, in this one, I don't think, I think at some point I mentioned the idea of like lockdowns or whatever, but it, it was too much of a a straight Bible study with some, a lot of history um, and then some future speculation. I didn't put a lot of emphasis on the, on the pandemic there. I thought it'd be safer to not, not pick a big side about yeah, how it's yeah. going to turn out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But then fire in the rabbit hole was what re this year, early this year it came out. Um, did it come out this year or was it last year? Oh no, I think it was, it was middle of 2021. I think. I think it was. I yeah, know that. I should know this. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think now? Did you, is there, Oh, yeah, that's right. I was because I was going to ask you <laughs> so, so much has happened since your book came out. I mean, you know, you're gre the green. It's hard to believe how overt this climate change narrative is <laughs> trying to squeeze its way into the <laughs> covid cult. I mean, you know, there's the, you know, climate change is causing heart attacks and all kinds of stuff. I mean, what is there, are you surprised at what's happened since your book or was there stuff that you wish you would have been able to put in there? Um, I do think about doing a second edition, but not as much because of the, the current events that are happening with, because I mean, that's just completely on track for what I've, 
what I concluded and what I was trying to warn people about. So in a way I could be like, Hey, check it out. You know, what I said was coming true. Uh, what I feel like is that I learned a lot better sources for the things that I was arguing. Um, I've looked a lot more into new age authors and where they get their ideas from and, and how old and sort of consistent the pattern is leading up to this. I used, I thought that it was a lot more abrupt, you know, it sort of came out of left field in the last couple of years. And I didn't realize that how much there was going back to the eighties and nineties and already, there was a lot of this. And then, um, but yeah, I mean, sure. For the, the green movement, especially it's like, it's showing its fangs. Now people are starting to understand that this is an actual threat. They're starting to understand that, um, anything goes with this. Like they can claim that uh, I've seen people say that, you know, fertility rates and, and uh, just all sorts of things, climate change is just magically affecting everything. And you can just lump everything under that umbrella. And suddenly you have a, a, a call to deindustrialize and, you know, shut down industry and shut down oil or whatever they want to do and control carbon and control all human movement and it's like just in the name of climate change because everything gets lumped in there and i think it's a religion i think it's uh, a cult and so um, that is i think just going to become increasingly obvious until and I, I don't know i was kind of surprised that um how quickly people are catching on to it too because i thought that there was going to be a lot more grassroots support of this environmentalism, even if it was extreme, I thought there was going to be a lot more grassroots environmentalist support. But even environmentalists are like, this is crazy. This is not what we signed up for. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. I mean, do you think they've overplayed their hand with all this stuff over the last you know, year, especially with the jabs and the, I mean, the misinformation on, on coming from official sources and then calling everybody that's not official misinformation. And I mean, do you think they're, they overplayed it? I mean, are people waking up? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that's an expendable narrative. And I, I think that it did its part. So it doesn't really matter that they, they overplayed it because they don't need people to buy into it fully. They just need, um, they need to work long enough to do what it was intended to do, and then they can move on to the next one. So to destroy the middle class is is one of the biggest things. And it's like, it doesn't matter who believes what, they still destroyed the middle class. They still shut down, you know, tens of thousands of small businesses and, for, you know, printed trillions of dollars and gave it to corporations for bailouts. And they still did all the things they wanted to do. Yeah. So I, in a way, I feel like we have an age now of very disposable psyops that are just constantly being churned out and they can it doesn't matter if we catch on it it's they're just moving on to the next I, one already. i agree they in some ways they want us to catch on more because there's not enough of us for them to clamp down on i mean if, if we were revolting a little bit more then they'd be able to put the clamp down on us i mean but they can't yeah. even do that because we're just there's too many people just go, going along lie after lie i mean it oh it's unreal so what let's i mean there's so many things to get into here let's do we talk about a little bit about sort of your past and, and, and sort of your, your sort of beliefs, the Christianity part, or do you want to get into sort of more of the new age stuff? Like how, where do you want to go from here? Uh, sure. We can talk a little bit about my side of things. It's, um, it's pretty straightforward. I, I was raised a Christian, uh, but I, it was really, uh, you know, early teens when I actually understood what it was. I had, a I had an experience, a conviction of, of sin and, and, uh, you know, turning to, to Jesus properly and actually giving my life to him and, uh, realizing that what I had been calling Christianity was just a very self-righteous and judgmental sort of state of mind. And I didn't actually understand it properly. And, um, since then I have, you know, I have a family that's Christian and are actually genuinely good influences. And so I never really got disillusioned with that side of things. But you're not like it, a recovering Catholic, as they say. No, exactly. No, I actually had I, I was raised in the uh, um, Mennonite tradition. 
I was um, I was watching your I was reading your blog that you had on that website of the dissident thinker there. And you're from Canada. You're from close by. I think you're from Saskatchewan originally, aren't you? Uh, Manitoba. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. And so uh, I come from Mennonite stock and uh, I respect them. Um, I respect the fact that they were simple, hardworking, honest um, and just wanting to read the Bible themselves, wanting to hear the stories, not having a big agenda attached to it not being greedy. Certainly the, the ministers and pastors and stuff were have full-time jobs and they're working and they're not stealing people's money. And there, there's a, it's a very good, um, at its heart, it's a very good and, and simple type of Christianity that I could get behind. Um, and the only thing is that they were kind of, um, they weren't willing to go on the attack. And they, I felt like they were especially in the internet age, they're so old fashioned that they weren't willing to, you know, uh, defend things properly in this time where ideas are flooding in from everywhere. Thanks to the internet, even a small town that's in the middle of nowhere, you know, all the kids have the world in their pocket, you know, they're seeing yeah. everything. So yeah. um, in a way I, that's where I was like, okay, I don't know if I can just go along with this because they're just going to keep saying their traditional beliefs and they're not going to defend them properly because they're kind of like, you know, it's 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 adjacent to the Amish sort of style of thinking where it's like, leave us alone and we'll just continue on our way. And we're happy to be in a bubble sort of thing. And if that works, that, that can be fine. But in reality, uh, with the Internet and with smartphones and everything, um, we're there. We're we're in New York. We're in L.A. You know, the, that's the culture is the same. There's so. um that's sort of where I broke off from that and wanted to do a lot more of my own research. And um, from there, it's been a process of looking into conspiracy theories, looking into um, trying to make meaningful connections between world events and prophecy. And, um, you know, around here, I don't know if they have it where you are, but they have prophecy conferences where, uh, you know, different Christian speakers get together and they, a lot of it is conspiracy theory because we're, what you do is you look at prophecy and you say, how is this happening today or is this happening today? And so there's a lot of talk about the mark of the beast and about the Antichrist and all these types of things. And I grew up watching a bunch of that stuff and thinking, mm, I don't know, that's a little, you know, isn't it too early to call that? Isn't it, you know, what? And then so, you know, it used to be the barcodes and then it was, you know, this idea of the microchip planted under your skin and, and these different things. And it's like, well, now it's really back at the forefront again. And people are wondering what is this universal currency going to be and stuff. So I feel like I've been in sort of the relevant discussions related to that stuff for a long time. And then I'm, but I'm a naturally skeptical person. So even when I hear a Christian speaker talking about prophecy and they're, you know, they're reading the latest magazines about you know, internet technology and microchips and transhumanism and all these things. I'm still skeptical. I'm still like, I don't know. Are you guys really tapped into what's going on or are you falling for some other trick yet? And so I, I don't know. That's kind of my take on things is that um, I'm skeptical of everyone and I want to be aware of the fact that Christianity and Christian subculture is also a target of the uh, agendas of people there's zionism for example is a very aware of christian subculture and they're trying to promote certain agendas all the time uh freemasons have their own interest in christian subculture and we're a, we're a demographic you know we're people want our money they want our support they want our stuff too so be like wolves in sheep's clothing are everywhere so we I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of aware and, of that. Well, and it's always been, I mean, the, the persecutions against Christians that don't follow um, the, the church and the, you know, Rome or whatever. I mean, yeah. they've always been persecuted, right? I mean, you mentioned some of that in your books too. And I've been reading about that with reading these old books. I mean, just from like the, whether it's the friends of God or the, I don't know if the Cathars were Christian. I can't remember, but the Albigenses is, I mean, there's all kinds of these communities that were hunted down yeah. because they were just following what they thought was the, the, the gospel, right. Or the true scriptures instead of the church, what the church was telling them to follow. Absolutely. So yeah, that's the thing is, and then I did grow up and Mennonites were very persecuted. Um, originally Menno Simons, the founder of the 
that thing, or I guess he was, you know, he didn't want it to be called anything after himself, but they ended up calling themselves Mennonites because of they followed oh. him. Um, so yeah, it was a Menno Simons. It was just, I think he was Dutch and he was, uh, um, around the t- same time as Martin Luther and stuff. And he had a very literal view of the Bible. He didn't believe that there should be any Catholic church or any big institutional religion at all, just a personal faith and this kind of stuff. But yeah, he, he ended up getting hunted by the Inquisition and literally hunted through forests and through wherever. And his people were protecting him and it was an underground church and, um, Ultimately, you know, the people around where I live, they don't know their history. They don't realize how special they are. They don't realize, they just take it for granted that, oh, this is what my grandfather believed. This is what I do. But so you do your history on this stuff. It's like, we're actually a rare breed that was being, you know, hunted by the most powerful organization in the history of the world, basically, the Holy Roman Empire. And, um, and, I read a book called Martyr's Mirror, which was a very eye-opening as a as a collection of thousands of testimonies of evidence of people, Christians who died for their faith. And I was like, yeah, this is this is serious. These people want us dead. They don't just want us to donate to their church. They think that we're scum and they want us to be eliminated. And all you have to do to find yourself in that camp to find yourself being a heretic that needs to die is to just reject their their authority reject their narrative and that's how powerful it is to to be on the wrong side of that uh, narrative and so i'm always on the lookout for different quasi inquisitions happening as well well yeah we're in a modern one right now i mean and then the the whole other side anybody that's not sort of christian seems to think that you know, the Christians did all the all the persecuting and, and the Inquisition. They've, I, I feel like that that side of Christianity you're talking about got sort of forgotten about. That's why I wanted to sort of bring it up. I mean, I was surprised at reading all these accounts, too. I made a note of that Martyr's Mirror as a book maybe to get into later on. It's it's uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I go as far, I go further than most people in that. I not only say that, um, you know, that the Catholic Church. See, the thing is, people, everybody who's not a, a genuine Christian just takes for granted that Catholics are Christians. They believe it, you know, and then there's even people who argue that it's a fallacy to say that it's, um, that they're not. You know, there's the no true Scotsman fallacy, the idea that, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I could, I could explain it. Um, So I've talked to a lot of atheists and debated, I used to debate them and stuff like that. And it's like, if you say that the Catholic Church doesn't represent Christianity, they'll say that's the no true Scotsman fallacy. And the no true Scotsman fallacy is that it's tied to a weird story. I don't know where else it's used except to try to trap Christians into into accepting responsibility for the, the Crusades and the Inquisition. That seems to be the only time it's ever used. But anyway, the story goes that there's a Scotsman who's reading his newspaper and there's some Scottish guy who uh, commits horrible crimes. And he says, uh, uh, but he doesn't know that he's Scottish. He just says that no Scotsman would ever do that. You know, a Scotsman would never commit that crime. And then, you know, the next day that a follow-up happens and it's revealed that it was a Scotsman who did these horrible crimes. And then he says, well, no true Scotsman would do that. <laughs> you know, a true Scotsman wouldn't do it. And so that's the argument that, you know, there's this supposed fallacy that comes out of that. And it's funny and and it's true. You know, if you're going to say something like that, you would, you can't just weasel out of it by saying that no true one would do it. It's just that in the case of Christianity, you literally have a book that you weren't on talking about genetics. You're not, nobody's born Christian. It's a it's a thing that you you become as you conform to the the rules of the text. It's it has qualifications. It's like the Jesus is talking about those who are true and false and you can judge them by the fruit of you know what they do and stuff. So it, it's actually completely non-applicable to Christianity. Christianity is the most um the most obvious example of if you're not doing these things, you're not a Christian and Christianity does not need to take the popes into account the, in, and say that Christianity has done this or that, because if you're not 
doing the things that Christianity says, you don't qualify as a Christian. You don't just, if you just call yourself Christian, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't drag down the image of Christianity. It just proves exactly what was said in the New Testament, that there was going to be a lot of fake Christians and a lot of imposters and a lot of false prophets and a lot of uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And so anyway, that's where um, you could say that Christianity has waged wars and killed people and and done crusades and inquisitions and stuff. I don't accept that at all because it just simply doesn't conform to the teachings of Christianity. And so therefore it's, it's some other group, it's some other force that is using that in name for their own advantage. So what would you, what would you, I hate to ask for labels and, and categories and stuff like that, but just for my own understanding. So where, where would you fall into right now, as far as like, how would you categorize your faith or would you fall into one of these persecuted groups in the past? I am at the point now where I just say that I'm a Christian and um, I don't think that denominations are appropriate or relevant. Even even? I don't think, well, I mean, they're relevant if you want to understand the people groups. Um, You know, if you want to understand the different factions, that's, you do need to take seriously what they call themselves. But um. I think true Christianity does not have a denomination. It doesn't have an institution. It doesn't have a headquarters. It doesn't have a, a building. It's a organic decentralized thing that emerges um, as people, you know, prove their faith in, in real life. And so I feel like I'm part of a, a network of believers across the whole world that in China and other places where, we're all pursuing God. We're all uh, looking into the Bible and we don't need a denomination to, uh, and a tradition and an apostolic uh, lineage or whatever they call it. Um, There's a lot of fanfare made about the sanctity of these traditions and their age and their, you know, so respected and stuff. And I don't attach myself to any of that. I just want to have a personal faith. And I feel like I'm connected to the other people who are like that. Yeah. Well, can you help me understand then how, how, um, um, how to reconcile all the, the ancient um, religions and scriptures that came out of, I don't know if scripture is the right word, but came out of like Egypt and prior to Christianity. I mean, there's a quote from this book I was just narrating uh, this week that talked about the reason why Christianity became uh so popular was because here i'm going to read it to you christianity was indebted to many of these sources and many scholars believe that it triumphed only because it was the most successful syncretism of many diverse elements numerous streams of esoteric doctrine contributed to christianity we can merely hint at a large body of evidence available at this point so regardless of whether the church is behind it or not like they've shown and this is you know from the 1800s and, and even before that um that there's so many instances of the Egyptian book of the dead, for example, with Horus and Jesus, like there's like, I mean, uh, George, George Massey, Gerald Massey writes uh, in his appendix to his, his Egypt, the light of the world book has eight pages of comparisons between Egypt and Christian and, and Christian, the Bible, like that are exactly the same, you know, like Horus, the, you know, the gracious child, Jesus, the child full of grace, Horus, one of five brethren, Jesus, one of five brothers, like, it goes on and on and on with the comparison. So does that take anything away from Christianity or just because it may have been, might have been copied or not copied, but u- utilized or how do you reconcile that? Uh, no, it, all it does to me is it shows the, uh, the ongoing effort to delegitimize Christianity by massaging the truth and, and ignoring differences, trying to lump it in with ancient paganism. And uh, I, I, I used to be uh, concerned about that and I looked into it and in every instance there are like, you know, you'll see, I don't know if it was Horace or who it was, but they'll say that he had 12 disciples and he, you know, like they'll like really down to yeah, yeah. specific numbers and stuff. And he was 32 years old when this happened and whatever the, and it's like, that's just not true. You go back and look at, you have to look at the primary sources. Where are they getting this information from? And it's nothing. It's some guy who wrote an essay and you look up his source, you're yeah, trying to get yeah, to the, yeah, the yeah, prime yeah. source. Yeah. There, is, there is none. The Book of the Dead doesn't actually say that. There's key differences in all these things. And then you can ask yourself, okay, 
you know, why is this being promoted? Um, and who is saying it? Where do they, why are they, you know, being so uncritical of their own sources of seeing these parallels and then being so critical of the Bible and of this ancient testimony, the, the, the epistles and the stuff that the early church was writing and producing. Um, so a lot of that is just hoaxes. It's nonsense. And then you have to, you have to s- split the difference and say, well, it's close enough though. I mean, it's, it's kind of close. And it's like, all right, but there was also prophecies that existed for thousands of years before Christ came hinting at the type of thing that was going to happen and foreshadowing it in different ways through rituals and symbols and Judaism. Ancient Judaism had all these different ways of foreshadowing it. So even, even somebody who didn't know anything about, you know, um, except these traditions would have been able to know that there was going to be a sacred child that was going to come by and he was going to be destined to lead the world. And, and, you know, the, he was going to be the son of God on, on some level, even if not literally. And so it's like when you have a prophecy that's essentially setting up the framework or the scaffolding for the story, um, somebody else can come by and, and uh, utilize that. So it's a question of whether Egypt was, was stealing from older prophecies or, or was, you know, Judaism that comes out of there, the Jews that escape Egypt and then go on to become um, uh, Israelites that are unified in their belief in the Moses law and all that. I, I think that it's, um, there are certain things that are archetypal and they just keep Yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. If it, it might just be that, it's a thing that's in the in the I mean, I don't want to use too many new age terms, but it's kind of in the collective consciousness. Conscious, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's like um, inventors inventing stuff at the same time that there's some sort of inherent archetypes or truths that keep popping up in every religion. I mean, yeah. And, and so getting I, back into syncretism in a way, too. So but if you look at and I think but I think that's valid. And I think that, you know, the thing is that we don't live in. Uh, monarchies and absolute monarchies, especially anymore, where, you know, it used to be that, you know, the whole world was constantly obsessed with the idea of who was going to be the next king and who was going to secede the, uh, who was, how would it be passed down and who would receive the inheritance and all these things. There's, and so to us, those are almost mythological concepts to begin with. And, but within their culture, that was just, the culture. It was just normal. Who is the prince and which of the princes is going to inherit the thing? And will he be a righteous king or will he be an evil king? Because he will literally have the power to kill my whole family if he feels like it. And there's nothing I can do. I don't have any rights. And so they would be obsessed with this idea of the perfect king who would someday show up and who would rule benevolently and create peace and prosperity in all the lands and reconcile all these different tribes. And, you know, all these things that are seem like archetypal mythology was literally true back then. And then you just have to take a little step further and you get to the chosen one and the chosen king who was someday we believe is going to come by and fix all of our problems. And it's just in the case of Christianity, um, you know, they have this, in a weird way, they have a complete subversion of all of the expectations that was going on at the time that people wanted Jesus to be or the the Messiah, they wanted the Messiah to be uh, an iron fisted ruler that was going to crush Rome and crush all of the rulers and destroy the Gentiles and, you know, set up this invincible eternal kingdom of oppression. And he does exactly the opposite. He, you know, is kind to everyone and he's hanging out with sinners and he's, um, you know, teaching them that they're wicked for wanting that to happen. And, he doesn't challenge Rome in any significant way, really, and he lets himself get killed. And and so it's actually a subversion of a lot of those things. And um, so for pagans, for for modern scholars to look at paganism as being this big inspiration for Christianity is kind of laughable to me because of how radical and subversive Christ actually was. Um, he doesn't fulfill these old expectations of what the chosen king was going to be like. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's... 
That's yeah, what I think. No, there, that, there's that's that's a good. I mean, I, I let, yeah, that's interesting. I think it's a it's a good answer. I mean, I've got another one here for you, kind of wrapped around the new age sort of stuff. Is I mean, because I was going to ask you about reconciling new age, because new age seems to come from Eastern traditions quite a bit. If you look right. at the similar stuff to the you know to yogi the yogis and and uh, a lot of the even Buddhism and stuff is sort of like mixed in with all that. And then another another quote from this this book that I was reading on, uh, on theosophy that was, uh, um, talking about ancient, um, a modern revival of this ancient wisdom from Alvin, Alvin Boyd Kuhn. He writes, um, and he's quoting, he's quoting theosophy, but he writes, uh, the Christian scriptures were themselves replete with incidents of the supernatural with necromancy, witchcraft, miracles, ghost walking, spirit messages, symbolical dreams, and the whole armory of thaumaturgical exploits. The doctrine of Satan was itself calculated to enliven the imagination with ideals of demoniac possession and was all the more credible by reason of the prevalence of insanity, which was ascribed to spirit obsession. And the reason why I just I read that is because I find it fascinating that they were really this was going back to the 1800s again, the mid 1800s, late 1800s, like where the, a lot of this new age stuff came from theosophy and spiritualism back then. I mean, it was really, really growing and huge in the 1800s. Absolutely. The 1800s is this explosion of Eastern fascination, um, Oriental, whatever, and, and because um, travel and communication and this sort of cross-pollination of these cultures gets to the point where um, with the decline of papal authority, the, the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, the um, people... Well, the Reformation is... It would be what, earlier, the, I guess, right? It's 1500s or something like that, I think. But um, So there's a, there's a couple hundred years there where the the Catholic Church is trying to hang on for dear life as the leader of the intellectual world. And um, as they're declining, um, you have more and more interest in alternative beliefs and in humanism and atheism and evolution. And so the 1800s is sort of this crisis point where traditional Anglican and um, Vatican authority is no longer fashionable. And then, so you get, yeah, you get this fascination with foreign cultures and um, it, you know, you can see it all the way into like the 1960s and the early James Bond movies with the, you know, the, the fascination with the Asians and Chinese people and judo and stuff. And it's like, there's these, there's this mystical love affair with everything that comes from the East. And that's huge in the 1800s with theosophy and, and Blavatsky and these different things where um, they're taking these ancient mythologies from that side. And now just because they're foreign, they're exotic. It has this ring of, you know, um, power and su being a suppressed thing that we need to, you know, true intellectuals will appreciate. And um, I think it's kind of hokey in that sense. It's like, well, what about their claim that all this, all this stuff, all this stuff that you would sort of push against nowadays was in they're saying that we're in the Christian scriptures themselves. Well, I, I do you have, do they have examples of um, necromancy, for example, or, or something like that? Like, I don't know. I, I look at, I listen to that list and I'm thinking, okay, I know that the, <laughs> the early church is it certainly were very confused. They were, you know, they needed a ton of, guidance and they were getting into all sorts of terrible things um the reason why we have the new testament is because the it was chaos it was all these people who suddenly were breaking away from this very rigid temple you know uh system of legalism and sacrifices and atonements and and sabbaths and all these things from the jewish tradition and suddenly they're now free and they're you know, mixing in with Greeks and Greeks have their whole, they've absorbed stuff from Babylon and from all these other cultures and Persia and stuff like that. It's this big melting pot of Greek culture and they're thrust into it with this. Now there's no rules. And so the re that's why we have Paul and these apostles writing to them and being like, Hey, stop doing this. Stop doing that. Stop trying to, you know, have sex with your mother. That's there's, there's, we're not under the law anymore, but you can't go that far. Like there's this sort of, they're trying to rein in the, different heresies and crazy things that are happening in the early church. And that's what the new Testament is, is sort of this record of the early 
battles that they were fighting to try to keep things orderly and and set a better doctrine at that time. So I have no doubt that there was witchcraft and crazy things happening in the early churches. Um, but I don't think you could find anything in the New Testament that would endorse that or say that it was. No, I don't think they're saying that. I think what they're doing is they're interpreting the rituals and the ceremonies and calling that thaumaturgy or, you know. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Ghosts, well, probably. I mean, that's what I would guess is that because they don't show any examples here either. But I think they're probably looking at at, at the actual process and maybe calling it. I mean, miracles are one thing, but I mean, talking about ghost walking and spirit messages and symbolical dreams. I mean, I don't know. I, that is kind of a mishmash of all, all kinds of stuff. And I mean, I think a lot of that is, I think what they're trying to say, and this is super speculation, but that, that the Christians are performing magic, just like the rest of the ancient I know. traditions, you know, <laughs> I, I do know that that's a popular belief among, uh, mysticism and Gnosticism that, um, Christianity and Jesus was essentially uh, some sort of magician um, that they think that he studied in Egypt and that he had this um, like Leo Zagami and these other guys will come in and, and have their uh, they'll basically teach that. Yeah. Christianity is they'll even say that it's valid and it's powerful and it's interesting. And but what they say is that you have to read between the lines and that there's, you know, this whole other story that's playing out in this story that, is only for the enlightened initiated mystics who understand. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And so and that's just bullshit. That's completely fake. It's when what Gnosticism is where you read between the lines so much that you ignore the lines <laughs> themselves. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and that's just the playground of Satan and of liars and of deceivers who want to manipulate those who, who love the truth. They want to say, Oh, you want to know the truth? Well, you know, ignore what the text actually says. I'll tell you the secret meaning. And, um, you know, you can just look at, I mean, it, and then the older something is, the more it becomes uh, romanticized. And it becomes this idea that just because somebody in the 1800s said something, you know, they, wow, this is an old belief. This is a traditional thing. And if it's from the 1600s then you know, Kabbalah mysticism or something like that, you know, they reinterpret and, and that's sort of the Talmud sort of thing as well. They go and they take these ancient texts and they read into it and they derive all these false beliefs from it. And they're just people. They don't have any magical insight. They're just making it up because it sounds cool. And, um, and, and then we go back hundreds of years now and we say, well, this is a hidden mystical truth that you you learn at the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. And they teach you these things like the, the Illuminati is this whole idea of the, the enlightened intellectuals who, and, and theosophy itself, this idea of this brotherhood of people who can, and syncretism really is, is what it comes down to, is this idea that all religions are the same. And once you know how to read them, once you know how to interpret them properly, they're telling the same story over and over and over in different ways. And, and that's just completely false. And it's this exercise, it's an intellectual exercise that's interesting. But the ones you actually take it seriously and you're like, uh, you ignore the, the historicity of it and the real traditions that come out of it, the, the differences between them, the battles between these different uh, things and the fact that conveniently, they're always aimed at pretty much subverting Christianity in particular. That seems to be their main target that they want to plant the seeds of doubt in and be like, no, this actually, it's something else. It's, it's the same as ancient paganism or it's something else. I, I think that's, um, it, to me, and I tell other Christians, this is like, you can notice this pattern of intellectual dishonesty that has a bias towards discrediting Christianity in particular, while promoting the legitimacy of Eastern mysticism and things that nobody really takes seriously on its face value. We're not actually Buddhists and stuff like that, but they, it's sexy to be a Buddhist and it's, it's lame to be a Christian. And it's, so it's appealing to have this, um, this new age Eastern obsession while dismissing the thing. Guess what? It's the thing you grew up with, your parents believed in. And it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Like it's, uh, which, which what you write in your book that that's to be expected, right? As a Christian. I mean, yeah, this isn't like a, 
a shock or something. No. I mean, you've sort of put out there that this is like to be expected and this is the way it's going to be. I mean, but I do want to sort of answer your, your point about the 1800 stuff. Like I, I get it. I get what you're saying. The reason why I like to bring it up is because for me, it's, it's, um, it's more intriguing that they were actually fight. It's, and I, and I didn't realize how much they were fighting against, not just the dogma of the Christian church. And cause, cause you're right. It was mainly about, Christianity compared to other dogma, do, uh, religious dogmas, but also sci- uh, materialism and scientism. I mean, they were really sure. seeing that yep. materialism was a main problem back then. So to me, it was creating this huge middle path of spirituality where we accept that there's uh, something greater. There's a phenomena. There's all this stuff that that is actually real, but we didn't want the dogma of the church. And I'm not saying we as in like I'm a theosophist or anything, but we didn't, you know, it, it's sort of where new age, a lot of the new age people sort of gravitated, which I think is, is more of a healthy, healthy place to be than what you would think um, in your book and stuff. But that, that, you know, we don't want the dogma of the church or scientism, you know, those are both kind of, there is a middle, a middle path, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's a lot of the intention um, was to, uh, for the for the people who promoted it, it was there to explore uh, truths and to not be beholden to any dogma at all from any side, and to keep exploring um, and never being satisfied with what you find necessarily and uh, firsthand experience with it and testimony. And so you get like New Age is not a, obviously it's not a proper religion or it doesn't have a set list of beliefs and tenets and it doesn't have a dogma it is this loose umbrella term for all these different practices and and people going on their spirit journeys forever and so um <laughs> <laughs> forever looking for that truth i mean you you're you're right like you nailed it in that book i was reading i'm like well yeah that's kind of what we're doing that's what and i fall into that trap all the time like i'm just looking for that new, it's almost like a, a dopamine reaction to new information and new truths and the rabbit holes themselves. I mean, it's, it's intriguing, but, but um, w- w- are you seeing a, a resurgence back to Christianity from the new age? I heard somebody say there's even a term for it right now that there's like, there is people that are sort of going. And I think it's because of all the overt symbolism and the, the, uh, what would I had a note here? How did I, how did I word this? Um, it's like, there's an increase in this overt and obvious satanic imagery and symbolism, it seems. And and is that causing a resurgence into Christianity? Like, and, and then the other part of the question is like, why are they so obvious with this? Like whoever they is, like, is it just for trolling? It feels like they're just trolling us. Um, I, I don't get the sense that, there's a bunch of new agers who are switching to Christianity. I know there are a couple of examples and I find them very interesting and they come away with the interesting testimony and maybe they're helping other people to do it. I think that relatively speaking though, that's, that's a, uh, you know, a fish swimming against the stream in this, in the majority of people are The majority of Christians are losing interest in institutional Christianity. Um, and they are like, I mean, in the church, there's a, this huge breaking away of institutionalism and some of them end up into the situation where I am, where they're they're actually more dedicated than ever than they were when they were institutionally thinking. And they're more interested in the scriptures and taking it seriously and doing their homework on all of it. And then there's a much larger, there's moving into the new age, especially those who have, um, I find that it's correlated with people's guilt and um bad experiences in the church and because new agers are so accepting and they're not judgmental at all. And they're, they're very um, compassionate and everybody sort of, especially with syncretism, they basically literally can take any belief system and say, ah, you're welcome. You know, it's the biggest possible tent essentially. Um, So, you know, they're, (laughs) they're doing a very good job of being this open thing that Christians go into. So I don't think there's a trend the other the direction. Other oh, wow. That's interesting. Okay. But why, I, I so do why think, all this? Okay. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So I think in terms of um, the symbolism and the uh, satanic sort of imagery that's happening, uh, I think that on that level, I think what's happening is that the 
people who are setting up because this ha, you have to see it from the full Christian perspective that the world revolves around Christianity in the Christian worldview. It revolves around Jesus Christ. It's not a belief system of among belief systems. It's the target of Satan, who is the ruler of the world, and all of human history bends towards trying to stop Christianity. It's that's the the perspective of the Christian, and so what's happening is that there is a um the end times prophetic expectations of Christians are being toyed with to create a more and more paranoia yeah, and yeah. divisions within Christianity. So that I know I, as a somebody who does TikTok, and I have, you know, I have a hundred thousand, some followers. Now I had 200 some thousand, uh, in my old account before it got banned. You know, I got, <laughs> Why did all, it, get banned? it got banned, uh, Without breaking a single rule, they didn't tell me I broke any rules. I didn't get violate anything. Um, it just suddenly got nuked out of orbit um, after I made a video. I don't. I assume that it's correlated. Uh, last year, I believe it was. You had the around November. You had the COP twenty six environmental thing in, happening in the UN, um, and what That'll was happening? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. They had the the Vatican was hosting a an event where they invited all the religious world leaders, forty some different denominations in major world religious Sikhism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Islam. Everybody was invited to this event at the Vatican, and the Pope was hosting it. And they all signed a pact, um, which is a very odd thing for me, because what are, these aren't government officials. So if they sign a pact, they're signing a spiritual pact. They're not sp- signing a governmental pact. This isn't a policy that's going to be enforced. This is a, a religious event. And so I was like, hey, check it out. You know, I've been warning about the green movement and the green world order. Here is this. And after that, it started to go viral. And then it's just, boom, suddenly my account was disabled and and deleted and all my videos were removed. So um, as far as I know, it was because of that. So what? Um, what uh, before I interrupted you, sorry about that. Where were you going with, with that? Uh, what was I saying? Uh, you were, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, it was good too. I didn't want to ruin your flow there, but I think you were talking about. Um, uh, oh yeah, I was got, talking about people asking me questions because yeah. I had I had a big following on TikTok, and so I get a lot a lot of questions from people who are asking me about. Um, and now I'm going to forget what the, what their topic was, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but I think it was it was about um, uh, the symbolism. This how how come there's so much symbolism? Right. Um, yes. Okay. So yeah. that so the the thing is, I'm writing about Revelation in my book. Um, I'm opening the door. I'm saying maybe everyone is wrong. I include myself in that. By the way, I include the fact that I could be wrong. I don't claim to have all the answers. But um, so what happens is I invited in all these questions about end times, and so what I found was that, uh, especially with ignorant Christians, these sort of People who have come late to the game, they haven't done their homework, they don't know anything about the conspiracy theories, they're just sort of waking up now and suddenly at the last minute wanting to understand the entire history of everything and how we got to where we are. They're getting caught up in all of these different um, rabbit holes. That's actually what inspires you know me to write Fire in the Rabbit Hole. And so they start asking me about really dumb things that are just like, You know, I read in a magazine something about like some celebrity, like right now, for example, there's a really good example right now, which is Beyonce on the cover of Vogue magazine. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's huge in this Christian um, counterculture sort of thing. Everyone's talking to me about it. She's sitting on a on a red horse and it's this very red background. And so people are like, this is it. This is a sign that, you know the red horse from revelation we're it's now happening and i'm like that's vogue magazine it's nothing it what makes you think that vogue magazine has a mystical insight into the prophetic workings of god and you know revelation and they get to decide when when it starts happening like it's this knee jerk reaction another one last year i think was the some rapper had a, a new pair of shoes he came up with that had like 666 on it and the 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 gimmick was that it had a drop of human blood in it or something when it was in the manufacturing and they're like this is this is a sign of the end times and i'm like please 
grow well, up. But yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but there's some that you could say, huh? Why did they do that? Like the uh, the patent number for the for the Lucifer right. rays. I mean, there's all this vaccine stuff too with weird patent numbers, super symbolic six oh six oh six oh six. Like, come on, why would they do that? For sure. So, and that's where I think the psyop comes in to the level of saying we want Christians to be at high alert. We want them to be paranoid. And what they want to do is to trigger premature Uh uh, reactions. And because what ends up happening is that betrayals will end up happening very, very easily in churches. Christians are very, and this is true of basically conservatives all together, is that they're very quick to betray each other and to uh, um, uh, swear each other off. It's like, there's not really sort of a con- even though we are on the same side you'd think um it's like if we think that you're not telling the truth or you're with somebody else um it's like i have nothing to do with that person i don't want to you know we're we're all but distancing ourselves from things that we think are false and stuff so what i'm seeing is that every time one of these issues comes up it's a wedge issue and those who Wanted, who say it's okay to take the vaccine or not take the vaccine. Okay, that splits Christians hugely. And then if they say that there's some other thing, some policy that has a, a tinge of prophetic hints to it, it has some symbology to it, um, you know, they know by now, the, the conspiracy knows by now that we are a paranoid group. And it's well documented how to handle paranoid people if you want to create schizophrenia and sort of this overreaction in every single direction. And so uh, it's very hard to have a moderate, reasonable, evidence-based discussion with a group of people who are paranoid and already on the lookout for um, deception all over the place. So I think what they're doing is they're trying to hype up and create through hints and through these different things. QAnon was a big one to try to create these overreactions and, and, you know, pedophiles are running everything to the point where, you know, it's... um, uh, it's it's inescapable, and we just need to have military tribunals, and and Trump is the chosen one, and he's going to save us all. And you know, Baron Trump is a time traveler, and he came to, from the past to save us, and he's John Connor from Terminator, or whatever they think. You know, it's like all of that stuff is there for fodder and to get us worked up. Um, and they're toying with us, I think, and they they want us to. I, I believe in the. We're at the point, there's an actual specific Bible passage uh, that Jesus talked about in the end times. And he said that um, there was going to be rumors of wars and famines and tribulations, and that we're going to see a lot of people fall away and betray each other in the church, and that there was going to be false prophets and false believers. I think Matthew 24 and some other chapters have this description of what things are going to be like in the end times, and it involves schisms and um and betrayals among christians and so the more they can get people worked up about these different red herrings um the more they can cause divisions that are not going to be easily reconciled and i've had people because i said the vaccine is not the mark of the beast it's not even close to being that it has nothing to do with anything spiritual it, it might be the worst medical decision you ever make in your life, but it's not <laughs> spiritual. Um, it's a medical decision. And if you, if you think that it's, you know, the, the benefits outweigh the risk, go take it. I'm not going to say that you're going to hell forever because of it. And, um, and I don't want to take it. I'm never going to take it, but you know, I don't, this is the thing people, and then I lose followers and it's like, you know, Oh, okay. So you can't have a discussion about this because, Everything now, when you, when you just woke up and you're panicked, everything is the big one. This is the big issue. This is the thing we have to watch for. It's like, you're not hip to what they're doing. You're not realizing how easily and, they're manipulating us. And and it's not only the Christian group that's getting schismed and split down the middle. It's every group. I mean, it's the yoga yeah. community. It's a lot of the new age communities. It's the, your families. It's the all kinds of every, every little organ. Everything now is being split left, right, and center. True. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So yeah, they don't want us unifying. That's for sure. So, but you guys, you, if you, if you're really following what you're following here, you're sort of prepared for this too, right? You're prepared to be ostracized. You're prepared to be 
kind of uh, pushed into further into the counterculture as this thing crumbles, right? Yeah, and that's that's one of the most common things that I do is to try to tell Christians that we are have to get used to the reality that, that there's going to come a time where we become an underground society again, and um, they could easily, easily at some point, um, you know, one or two false flag operations or whatever it is. Exactly. They could suddenly say that, you know, oh, these guys were motivated. They wrote some manifesto based on the Bible. Um, it's a hate group now. It's anti-vax. Um, yeah. You're an anti-vax hate group. And and if you believe, if you have the Bible, that's proof that you're part of this terrorist network. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> It's like, just get get ready for it. It's, you know, there's no reason to think that we're going to have a, a smooth ride going forward. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that being marginalized, being schismed, um, deception from every single possible avenue they can think of, and then major, major false hopes is one of the biggest dangers of all that I try to tell people. The, the false hope, the idea that Trump is going to save the world or that, you know, Israel and the Zionist side, that... that you know, Israel is going to save the world. If you believe in that side of things, that it's um, the the rebuilding of the temple and the the uh, you know, there's there's so many different things that I've seen uh, where those hopes end up transcending even like the faith of the the actual promises of the Bible. It's like I, I know guys who's basically their religion is based on the protection of Israel, and it's like. Uh, as long as Israel exists and it's, you know, a, a military superpower and it has its thing, then I know that the Bible is true and it's good. And, and this is what essentially if something happened, bad happened to Israel, they would like their faith would be shook and they might lose their faith in God and, and these types of things. And so I try to warn people just to. Uh, and that's part of the the plan or part of the book is to play out the thought experiment and say, what if this happened? What if that happened? Um, how bad can it get and how bad would it have to get before you lose your faith and before you say it's not worth it anymore to be a Christian or what if they, what if literally we saw aliens come down and they seem to be totally legit and they come out and they say, we are ancient spiritual beings. We're, we're the ones that guided human evolution. We, uh, we give you these technologies and suddenly we live in this new age of prosperity. Is Christianity dead at that point? Or is it more true than ever? Is it, are these demonic forces that are impersonating these things because they know that and they've been preparing this deception for humanity? Or is it, um, you know, this proof that Christianity is dead once and for all and that, and that, you know, we just had one little puzzle piece that syncretism actually explains better. And so I play out these thought experiments for the sake of asking, um, you know, how strong is your faith? What would it take? And, and are you ready for this possible flood of information? Because I believe like going to the heart of the the whole topic, I think is what is the new age? What does the new age represent? And I think it represents this. It does represent a new era of humanity that is going to believe that it has transcended Christianity and that it no longer uh, needs the Bible for moral guidance. It is, Superior to that, uh, Christianity is outdated. It's part of the old age, the new age. You don't need it anymore. And, um, you know, the, the whole Aquarian conspiracy and the, the Aquarian age is this attempt, a power play to replace Christianity and to establish this, this new spiritual paradigm that has a lot of the, the most appealing parts of Christianity stolen from it the the love and forgiveness and um and sort of universal call to be part of the same family and all these types of things it's a very cathartic healing sort of uh, movement and um and so i think that there's no limit to how far the interest groups who are involved in that will be willing to go to reinforce that that sense that um down to like i said like I, you can look at project blue beam or whatever this idea of the the artificial alien invasion and the the hallucinations that people might have and whatever all happens the that they're going to try to create this sense that 
um, there's a turning point in human history and, and Christianity becomes obsolete in the process. So is that, is that the fall then? Is there a re- is there a, uh, like a rebound after that? That's I don't think so. I think this, um, when you, when you walk through revelations chronologically, um, as, as prophetic, um, and you tie it in with where we are now, if, if the fourth rider, which is the green rider in revelation, they each have a color. First one's white, second one's red, third one's black, fourth one is green. Um, most translations translate that as pale. Pale green, some, the pale green, yeah. The pale green horse. Um, the, the the Greek term that is used in the original text is chloros, which means green. It, does, it really doesn't shouldn't be translated as pale. But um, I believe that the green rider prophecy that we are currently entering um there's it's not a rebound type of situation it is persecution it's going to increase tribulation there's going to be a giant falling away as it becomes inconvenient to be a christian that alone will make it 70 percent of christians will fall away right there it's a very very weak lukewarm type of christianity that we have today very comfortable hasn't been tested in the fire at all and um uh, and, and then those who remain, you know, become increasingly polarized and, and seen as divisive because we're not going to ever accept that there are multiple ways to salvation and that all religions are equal. We are going to continue to say that there is one exclusive truth and that all others are deceptions and false, false gospels and false salvation. And in that, that's one of the worst things you could say today. It, it used to be, I can believe that you can believe something yeah. completely the opposite and we coexist. But that doesn't happen anymore. You have to be inclusive if you want to survive going forward. Oh, yeah. And wait till you don't agree with the carbon tax and the and the climate change agenda and all this stuff. Right. That'll just be. And that's what you mean by green, too. Right. You, you, you've you yes. sort of made a correlation there with the Green New Deal and the green movement in general and this whole climate change agenda. And with new ageism, I think that the, the green heart chakra, the idea of the Aquarian age being this movement into the green heart chakra was once I found that out, I'm like, that's, that, that can't be a coincidence. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's this idea of this mother earth worship. Um, uh, the, the whole Aquarian age is the idea that everything that is outdated and no longer needed becomes obsolete and it is shook off and that mother earth itself will do this through um, famines and through sort of this, the Gaia, mother earth retaliation against mankind for polluting and for harming the environment and for killing the precious mother earth. Um, you know, it will have the earth and karma and everything has its own way of getting back at humanity and those who are divisive and those who are, uh, entitled and selfish and, and clinging to these old ideologies. And that's, this is all tied in with the Aquarian age, the new age. That's what the new age is, is the age of Aquarius. Um, and, and this astrological, you know, procession of the equinox sort of belief that um, that we're overdue for this revolution and that Mother Earth itself is going to partake in it. I have a, a quotation here from, um, I believe it's uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard. You ever heard of yeah. her? Yeah. Um, so here's something she says. Uh, she's channeling a... Uh, spirit when she's talking about this. So (laughs) she's saying, we, the elders have been patiently waiting until the very last moment before the quantum transformation to take action, to cut out, to cut out this corrupted and corrupting element in the body of humanity. It is like watching a cancer grow. Something must be done before the whole body is destroyed. This self-centered, the self-centered members must be destroyed. There is no alternative. Only the God-centered can evolve. And this is, of course, this is using the the Gnostic uh, doublespeak here, where those who are God-centered are actually the ones who don't believe in the Bible and don't believe in the traditional God. They believe that they themselves are God and they are part of this Godhood uh, pantheism. And the self-centered ones are the ones who believe in Jesus. But anyway, uh, it says, fortunately, you, dearly beloved are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. We will use whatever means we must to make this act of destruction as quick and painless as possible 
to the one half of the world who are capable of evolving. This is the very new age idea of the ascension, evolving in ascension, the evolving about ascension, yeah. human consciousness has to, uh, has to elevate to a higher frequency, all this kind of stuff. Um, now everything is global and connected. Each person is about to inherit the power of destruction and co-creation, the inner voice, the higher self, the each person's own connection to God, independent of priest, text, church, or mentor, must be heard directly. Those of you who know what is happening, the one-fourth who are now listening to the higher self, are to be guides for the rest who will be panicked and confused. So, Is that, is that a coincidence that they use one-fourth? I, I mean, it's inverted from what, what the prophecy says, which is that one-fourth will be killed. Um, now she's saying here at least one fourth at the time of that she was writing this. I don't remember when she said this, but um, uh, I, I, I think it might be a coincidence, but she also talks about one half who are capable of evolving and yeah. whatever. But yeah, the, the fourth rider of revelation does say that the, the green rider has the power to kill one fourth of the world. Um, so I, yeah, it's an interesting correlation. I don't know if it's, connected but so how long do you think we have then i mean i hate to ask these sort of pointed questions about no, i love those are the kinds of questions i love i mean you know because it's uh, really for, weird i mean we're going through such a crazy time and what an amazing time to be alive i mean to to see the outright lies and to see the the people just following along with the next current thing and then to see the schism and all these religions and and communities i mean what an amazing time yeah i my best estimate is just an estimate. I don't have any divine insight into it. But when I look at the the indicators, it seems like around 2030 is when they want to wrap the whole thing up. That's where all the, the signs are currently pointing. Uh, you don't see many predictions going beyond 2030 in terms of the globalist agenda and the and the transhumanist thing. It's like, um, and then you have the, the predictions about, um, I don't know if it's Apophos or what the the giant meteor, the planet killer meteor that Graham Hancock talks about in this um, this return of this planet killer meteor that could recreate the whole... Um, Younger drives. Right, exactly. Yeah, I forgot about that term. But yes, that, that's... So if that's true, and I don't have any reason to believe that it's set in stone really true or that it's debunked, I, I'm, I, I'm agnostic on whether that's true or not, but it does seem like that is what the timing people are preparing for is the around 2030 idea that we need to implement a, a, the global system before then something is going to happen at that point. And um, you're seeing movies like don't look up and these different things about meteors coming in and destroying things. And what do we do in that case? And there, I see uh, preparatory propaganda and, and con conditioning for that. Um, and so like, just like the climate change thing is like AOC and these people talking about, we're all going to die if we don't fix climate change by 2030. It's like, what is it about 2030? No scientist is saying that, or at least no credible scientist who had a career before the green movement, you know, the, the ones that were established already and didn't need the, the green bucks to come in and fund their research. You know, they don't, they don't believe 2030 is some magic year where there's no going back, but um, this, well, you, I think they've even named some of their programs around agenda 2030 and all that. Uh, absolutely. So for me, that's the that's the ballpark I'm believing. And I know for certain that within the I don't even I, there needs to be a term for it, but this sort of um, preliminary the, fall or. The, well, I was going to say the the paranoid Christian factions who are just sort of uh, scrambling now to to. Um, and I think it's controlled opposition in some way. So maybe I would just say that, it's that the, the Christian controlled opposition, the ones who are trying to create paranoia and, and um, I guess in, I don't, in some ways, <laughs> I guess I could be accused of creating paranoia too, but my, my message is not to jump on anyone's bandwagon for a solution. So it's not really, I'm not worried about it. And I don't think other people should be worried about it if you're a Christian, but anyway, um, there, there, there's this thing called the Bereshit prophecy and there's these different um, attempts that are trying to go viral telling people that there's going to be a seven year period of tribulation leading up to 2030. So that would be like next year, it has to really kick in. And then, you know, I think there's a giant script that is being prepared to get Christians in particular, because again, I believe Christianity is at the, 
at the center of world conspiracy um that they're they're we're the ones that they're trying to aim at. We're the ones that they're ultimately trying to get rid of, get out of the way. We're the last obstacle to this whole system being implemented. Um, they want this idea of the seven-year tribulation to play out. And then, so they, they 2030 would be a convenient time. And there's arguments that people are making for why that has to be the case um, within the Christian controlled opposition sort of thing. And uh, so to me, all signs are pointing towards 2030. And I say, well, may as well get ready for it as if it is, you know, mentally in, in, in our attitude. But obviously, I could be wrong. And I, I don't say that I, I have any magical insight into that. What do you got coming up next uh, for your for your work and stuff like that? And do, are you in Canada still? Yep, I'm in Canada. I'm not uh, I'm still working. I'm, you know, carrying on like <laughs> like normal. I'm not, uh, you know, prepping and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm just day by day, live by faith kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, I have different projects. I have a new website that I'm designing, um, trying to do longer form videos, more video essay kind of stuff. Um, I have two more books I want to write, but I don't even know if we have the time to make it worthwhile. Like, you know, by the end of this year with, you know, fuel prices and food prices and, and the, the calamity that they're trying to push it, are people still going to be buying books like when they can barely feed their kids? Like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's actually a legitimate question in my mind. What is worth doing at this point? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, in a way it's like, I just want to be focusing on spreading a very simple core message and hoping that it catches on before, you know, the internet gets shut down or whatever it is. The next move is, you know, the, the big move. So yeah. um, I have a bunch of stuff that I would like to publish, but I'm, I'm trying to adapt to the timeline that that it's realistic for us here. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, if you're ever in Alberta, look us up and we'll do a, we'll do a podcast live in our studio or not live, but in our studio to in face to face. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get to do that very often. So that would be, that would be fun. Yeah. I guess we're still allowed to travel in Canada, so I could still, I could theoretically <laughs> do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And just uh, regarding um do we still have time? Uh, a couple um, minutes. Say we got another show coming up. So okay. Um, so so one of the things about New Ageism uh, that I I wanted to bring up because you you brought me on here to sort of challenge that yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, there there's a verse in Second Timothy uh, in the Bible that is to me speaks to that, which we talked about the idea of the search for truth, and it says that um, there, it's a long passage but i'll skip out some parts of it but it says that this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come dangerous times will come men will be lover of their own them their own selves uh they'll be covetous there's a long list of negative traits that it says but uh, eventually it gets to saying that they have a form of godliness but they deny the power of it and that they are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth and to me, that sums up what is happening with New Ageism. It's a form of godliness. There's a lot of good intentions. There's a lot of genuine truth seeking, but they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible is to a New Ager very boring and static and non-experiential and dry and, and, and outdated. Um, and within Christianity is one of the biggest crises that talks about is just boredom with doctrine boredom with the bible they're just even if it's true it's boring so we don't care anymore we want something new we want something exciting we want something we can experience have out of body experiences go you know uh, have i don't deny that those things are true you can have all sorts of alternative spiritual experiences outside of christianity those are real spiritual experiences you're dabbling in something that's very dangerous but it's still a true spiritual experience and it gives you a small, small glimpse of the truth. But the real truth is there in plain English in the Bible. And so what happens, Satan, it wants people to be on a treadmill instead of going forward. They want them to just stay in place and have these vain experiences that don't lead to anything. The sort of um, always seeking and never coming to the truth is characteristic of the new age. And I have a lot of sympathy because I would have absolutely been part of 
the new age if it wasn't for my older brothers and people who were more grounded than me who talked some sense into me and showed me things like the martyr's mirror and this rich history that we have that proves that the true power and um and world revolution and the ability to make you know a difference in people's lives individually and and you see it when you see somebody who's you read the a testimony of somebody who's burning to death and they're singing a hymn and they're uh they're being falsely accused their families being murdered in front of them and they refuse to recant their faith it's like this transcends um a convenient religion it's not there anymore because it's you know you your parents believed it so you believe it and it's just sort of this non-thinking thing it's it's a powerful spiritual thing to be able to defend your faith even when you're suffering all of these things in the whole history of christianity and um and then you look at somebody who's in the new age system and they are they're doing all these attempts at discovering the truth and and i i feel sorry because they're getting close but they're um, and they even have a form of godliness but they're not realizing that they're basically just in the they're in the lobby they're in the waiting room of the truth you know they're just hanging out there forever they're never well, and, going and it's it is forever like it's a never ending journey i feel like it resonates with me because I've been saying it, we've been saying it for a while. And it's like, the more I learn, the less I know sometimes, you know, the more yeah, I go exactly. through this, the less I know. And it just becomes uh, uh, not confusing really, but just not, and not even overwhelming, just never ending. Yeah. And, and that is, I believe a fulfillment of this, this warning about the, the last days. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I think that it's, um, it's a satanic conspiracy. I find it very, um, telling that you have mar barbara hubbard and marilyn ferguson and and all these leaders these giants of the united nations and these world leaders who are pushing new ageism it's like if new ageism was really this forbidden truth that is um, that leads to this powerful enlightenment why are the most evil globalist un depopulation evil people pushing it why why is the green movement which is the most powerful thing taking over right now why is it pushing it and and i see a suspicious overlap there that i wish new agers would question a little bit more and be like are they just co-opting it because they know that it's a popular movement not really because they're you know um you have the uh lucis trust the lucifer publishing the the spiritual headquarters of the united nations you know they were theosophists. They believe in the new age thing. And it's like, they're right in there with you guys. And that's like, why are you bedfellows with them? Well, because it feels like counterculture because we're still run by materialism in a sense. I mean, the, the people that have the real control um, are, are think we're just a bunch of meat sacks with no purpose. I mean, it's so it still feels in counterculture in a way because it really is going against the dominant um, force right now, which is strict materialism. Like that's, I, guess I mean, that, you know, that's what Klaus Schwab's right hand guy is saying is like, forget the spirit and the soul. We're going to hack you now. Right. Right. Whereas I see Klaus Schwab as being, um, and that whole movement, you're talking about, uh, Yuval Harari, yeah, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am actually reading his book right now. Um, 21 lessons for the 21st century. And what I see what happening there is I see a very it's the same kind of thing that happens in Christianity is that they're setting up a false narrative designed to trigger a counter reaction. So, um, yeah, there, there's not going to be a metaverse. There's not going to be an AI God that rules us all. Materialism is has lost its wind. It, I don't see it as being predominant anymore. I see it as being. Yeah, it's, that's that's interesting. It's, yeah. it's like it's the way the post uh, capitalism, we're already late stage capitalism. We're in late stage materialism. It's running out. It's dying. They need the next thing to start already and so they're they're booting it up and they're planting the seeds for that and um and so yeah i guess that's my perspective changes that i don't i don't think that um that materialism is actually dominant anymore i think that spiritualism is and um new ageism is a is right on the forefront of that it's on the front lines of uh, pioneering this new type of spirituality that Bill Gates and and all these uh, Kabbalah mystics and different truth seekers, they're promoting it for that reason, I think. But 
that's my uh, that's my take on it. Is that New Age is not as edgy as it thinks it is? I think it's it's I think it's the advanced programming for the globalists uh, for the next phase of their operation. So. Well, that's a good, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, it's intriguing point of view. Well, I think, well, that's probably a good place to end it off. Sure. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate it, man. We'll have you back on sometime and uh, we'll do this again. I would like that. I, I appreciate it. It was a great discussion. All right, buddy. See you later. See ya.